Um, have a seat, John. Uh, be, before we start this, I, I just want to say, uh, and, and I'm going to read this because I don't want to screw it up. Uh, we want to thank uh, John and everyone at Kleiner Perkins uh, for supporting Code 2040 Entrepreneurs and Residents. Uh, if you don't know about Code 2040, it's an organization that helps create greater access and opportunities for top black, Latino, and Latina engineering talent. It's a great program, and they've helped bring a lot of the entrepreneurs here. Is anyone from 2040 physically here in the room? If so, just raise your hand quickly, briefly. I, I see hands. They're waving. I appreciate it for making it possible. And, and now in the most awkward transition, maybe, in the history of Brainstorm Tech, you've had an interesting year, John. Um, <laughs> so this is not what this interview will be about, but it is what we are going to start this interview about. Um, you guys, about uh, a couple months ago, you won this, this massive, you know, massive, at least in terms of media coverage, gender discrimination case with Ellen Powell. And I'm curious, in the end of this, when you look back at from the filing to the trial and all the coverage, what's the long-term impact on Kleiner Perkins been, both internally and also, do you think, externally in terms of perceptions? Wow, what a great question. Well, look, nobody wins in this kind of an experience. And I'm human. My partners and I are human. This was very painful. But, you know, at the end of the day, a, a jury of six women and six men, after five and a half weeks of testimony, decided we didn't discriminate. I want to get this out there. <laughs> we didn't retaliate and that the claims didn't have merit. It was like a vote of 10 to 2. It was decisive on the facts. Now, you asked what's been the impact on the firm. And one of the things Ted Schlein did really well is he concentrated the partnership on serving entrepreneurs and winning new investments and had just a few people, mostly outside legal talent, uh, working on this, this issue. I will say internally and emotionally it brought people together because we've got a good sense of who we are and what we stand for and the people who know us uh, know those things. But it also raised our, uh, our desire to do more. We know we can do more and we can do better. So, so we figured out four new initiatives that we ought to pursue. And, Which are? Uh, well, well, the first of, of them is to uh, called unconscious or hidden bias training. How many people have heard of that? Well, so most everybody does. So our firm went through it, and we're bringing it to all of our portfolio companies because we all possess biases, and being aware of them is one way to mitigate them. Now, the second thing we decided to do is, is to regularly hold ourselves accountable, issue a diversity report. So you can judge us not on our rhetoric, but on the results. Number of general partners that are diverse, uh, the uh, numbers of uh, fellows that come through our program, and that's the third thing we decided to do. For years now, we've had a program to develop the pipeline, right? Bring talent into the firm. Thousands of applications from all across the country, college age uh, talent, who then get internships, uh, mentoring, they're part of a network. And I, we doubled the diversity number there from 2014 to 2015 to 28%. And our target, what we've declared, is, is to get to 50%, a 50-50 world by the time, so that's the pipeline. And then the fourth program that uh, we've, we've signed up for and we're doing has to do with retention and advancement. It is really hard being the only, the only female on an engineering team, the only uh, African American in, in, in a boardroom, and, and so being conscious and committed to build networks of relationships, to find mentorships, uh, and, and so we convene uh, women leaders regularly, tech leaders. We ask them to bring protégés. We call them plus ones. We work to get them on boards, and, and that's what the partnership's doing. Look, I know we can do better. We can do more. I think it was a case of uh, uh, the right issue and the wrong plaintiff. Let me ask you about the let right. me ask you about right issue. In the aftermath, in, in, in the, a lot of the coverage at, near the end of it, a lot of the issue of gender and venture capital, tech more broadly, but venture capital particularly, got talked about a lot, not just in context of Kleiner. Since the trial ended, we've seen a number of kind of veteran Sand Hill Road firms either bring in female full-time partners or other senior investment staff. Now, some of it might be unrelated, but I'm curious. The trial obviously was not good for Kleiner Perkins. Was it good for venture capital? Well, it's good to be talking about this issue. 30% of the Kleiner general partners are female. I don't know, 45% I've seen that number once team. or twice. So, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm not the glass is half full. For me, the glass is overflowing. So I'm an optimistic person. And I believe this is an overdue conversation. It's a really important issue. 
and I don't want to try to speak for the rest of the venture industry, except to say that we collectively are pathetic on the issue. Six percent of the venture capitalists are female. Y you know, uh, as a matter of social justice, because it's better for business, because it's our values, that's, that's just dumb. Can I ask, I'm going to ask one final question. It's a very quick one, but I wrote about it a lot. Uh, you guys have said repeatedly, you, you said in your filings you couldn't settle, et cetera. The, the figure you offered, according to your settlement, was a little under a million dollars. That's a lot of money to me, but seems low for settlement. How do you know if it was impossible to settle if you never offered seven figures? Um, I will tell you and our audience that, one, I believe this should have been resolved outside the judicial system. Two, we tried very, very hard and it was not possible. It simply was not possible. All right, let, let's move on. Does Kleiner Perkins have a succession plan? And as piece of this, how much longer do you want to be a full-time venture capitalist? <laughs> so uh, Kleiner, since the decade I joined it in 1980, has had a succession plan. And that, no surprise, is to have diversity in age, ethnicity, and gender. So we have multiple generations of partners. Always it's been the case. Some partners in their 50s, some in their 40s, some in their 30s. We just added three in their 20s. So this is an ongoing process. And every time some partner is on the verge of retiring or we ask some partners to leave for a pretty visible firm, people say, what's the future? And I will say to you and to everybody here, the future is well in hand. We've made these Are you confident that a Kleiner, before. Am I what? You're confident, Kleiner, that you have the, the totally. next generation of, of, part, of people at the firm that in 10 years will be running the show? Yeah, look at the people that will. Well, Ted Schlein, Mike Abbott, uh, look at uh, Wen Shea. Look at the talent we brought in, Mary Meeker. Uh, and, and we didn't hire Mary because she's a woman. We hired her because she's the best that she can possibly be in the business, Dr. Beth Seidenberg. So we have a core group of Mudra Gwani's here. We've got a core group of investing partners and general partners, and we will add more. We've told the world we're going to have add a general partner in the venture group, add a partner in our, our, our growth stage group, and we're very, very selective. John, you said on this stage two years ago that uh, you, you, you had just joined the board of Zynga. <laughs> you said, and I quote, God wants the price to be above $10 a share. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, why hasn't it happened? And does God have any other stock tips for the audience? <laughs> well, you'll be gratified to know I've been talking with God. <laughs> and uh, he's impressed with the uh, uh, job that Don Matrick did pivoting to mobile. He approves bringing the founder back into the company. Mark Pincus is here. Uh, he and I are both surprised that these markets... Mark and you, not God and you, right? Say Mark and you. No, God and I are Oh, God and you, okay. <laughs> I just want to be sure. Are, uh, well, let me leave them out of this for now. We're surprised, continually surprised on the upside at how big the mobile gaming markets are to date. And each one of the stories at Zynga is, is, is separate and different. But these are not games. These are ongoing productions where you want to fine tune them with a lot of technology and, uh, and, and data analysis. So I haven't checked in on him with respect to hot stock tips. It turns out he's been pretty busy with the Pope and global warming and the encyclical, but I think- uh, Social gaming is not on the top of the list, huh? It's number two. Number two, got it, number two. Um, I want to talk a bit about kind of things you're interested in from an investment standpoint. It's more sectoral a little bit. You, you were asked this uh, recently in an interview, and I'm going to ask about two of them. The first one you talked about was education. And historically, when venture capitalists have invested in ed tech companies, it has not gone very well. It's why there's relatively few of those. Is there something structural? Is there a reason why generically education technology is interesting today from an investment standpoint? Right, so let's divide ed tech into higher education and broad-based K through 12 education. And for the moment, focus on the US, which we know pretty well, and they're different. But they both possess the property that they're among the most uh, resistant to change organizations that are really vital to our future and our economy. So uh, we've seen some bigger than billion dollar outcomes, right? Uh, LinkedIn bought Linda for a yep. billion and a half. Uh, I'm an investor, full disclosure, in Coursera which just delivered $8 million, received that on data science specializations with John Hopkins, one university. So there's real revenues there, real business models that are working. Uh, but K through 12 education is particularly interesting because for decades, technologists have fought to get technology into classrooms. Remember Bill Gates 
was going to put PCs in all the libraries. This is going to transform everything. And, and the institutions are bureaucratic, and they've got entrenched interests, and they don't have a lot of money. But while no one was looking, 70 million kids walked into the classroom with all the technology they need to follow their Khan Academy instructions or to develop their quizzes on Quizlet or a venture we invested in that I think of as the WhatsApp of education, Remind 101, has 30%, a fully a third of the US school teachers sending safe, secure messages to their students, to the parents. And the effect of that on outcomes are really great. So at Kleiner, we're very selective, but we think bigger than billion dollar companies can and we built there. That's I'm, education. I'm curious, is oh, it? Oh, and, and it's global, you know? Yep. It, can I just ask, I mean, the, matters a lot. can I ask quick, I guess, and it's a topic that doesn't get talked about that much, but a quick digital divide question. You talked about 70 million kids, not necessarily with an iPhone, but with a smartphone. Obviously, lots of kids also still without a smartphone. Does that become an educational problem if, if education, and, and granted, every school is different, every district's different, but if, if kids having smartphones becomes a really important part of education, education process for the kids who don't in the districts that can't afford to give their kids a phone? So even in the poorest of districts, most of the kids have a cell phone. Okay. Most of them really do. And so the Remind messaging can go just SMS to those. And that, that, that's changing. $100 Androids. Are re this is where the kids live. This is where you find the parents. The other, the other subject you talked about was the reason for optimism. The other subject you talked about, not virtual reality, but augmented reality. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your interest and what does that, as an investor, what does that tangibly mean? OK, so let's check. How many people know the difference between virtual and augmented reality? Whole audience, that's great. So in virtual reality, right, you block out the world and you have this immersive experience. Augmented reality, it's like that Star Wars chess game, you know, where the dragons are jumping over the other virtual creatures. And you Please and say, I, are you guys investing in that? Can we get that chess? Star Wars? Game? You will, with the yeah. dragons jumping, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, the surveys show that uh, by 2020, the uh, virtual reality business will be some $30 billion, and the augmented reality business will be four times bigger. 120 billion, total $150 billion of value. Uh, we invested in Magic Leap. I have the advantage on the audience of having seen it. I won't try very hard in words to describe it, but it's totally transformational. All this stuff that we do with the mobile devices to press on the apps or to mouse around is, is going to be replaced with a transformational new paradigm where it knows where you're looking, it knows the domain that you're talking about, you can use hand, hand gestures. Uh, I, I think everything from education, and Microsoft, by the way, with HoloLens, is going after enterprise applications first. So entertainment, education, instruction, uh, commerce, play. I, I can't wait to see a Magic Leap developer kit. There's been a lot of talk at this conference about the bubble, so I, or possible bubble yeah. boom, if you will. So I don't want to ask you exactly that. I guess what I'm curious about is, has Kleiner Perkins, do you feel in the last couple of years as valuations have, have risen substantially kind of across the, the food chain, have you guys had to raise your threshold for doing a new deal since any new deal you do, almost the fact you're probably putting more money in or getting less of the company? Yeah, so let me get at that two ways. The first thing I want to say is people compare 2015 in a bubble to 2000, right, the last bubble. But they lose sight of the fact that uh, there were no smartphones in 2000. It wasn't possible to distribute a billion copies of a new application globally in less than a week. So the markets we're trying to serve are much, much larger. I'd estimate a factor of five or 10 than they were in 2000. Now, if we can all agree on that, yes, valuations are larger, higher, especially private valuations. But at Kleiner, we believe, I believe that you can make really good returns for limited partners at any place along the spectrum, from the earliest of incubations, which Nest and Flexus were like, all the way up to later stage investments like Twitter, six times our money, or Lending Club, 11 times our money. But what you want to do in those later stage ones is be super choiceful, super careful, and disciplined. And so I, having a partner like Mary Meeker on the team, who's one of the best, I think, at figuring that out, Mood Rogwani, uh, has allowed us to do really well. Can I just ask, it, it gets talked about a lot. This is off topic, but you talk about how Mary is so good. Mary, though, had never been an investor. How did you know going in? You guys made her oh. a partner. How did you know she'd be a good investor, which is different than understanding industry? So uh, you don't know someone's a good investor and you, until you see them invest and invest very well. And so that's the leap of faith you make when you bring a partner on board. And then it's, at least at Kleiner, this is not silos with lone rangers and cowboys. It, 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 it's a team. We make all of our decisions collectively. 
And I know I'm a much better investor because I get uh, honest feedback, <laughs> not only from my teenage daughters, but from my partners <laughs> about uh, what, what's a good idea and what isn't. Uh, can I ask, John, in addition to Zing and God, one of the things you talked about when you were here a couple of years ago was, was, was kind of healing some of the wounds, but also kind of bringing technology and the broader community, kind of the, say, the Bay Area, you know, from the valley down to the city, together a little bit more. Since then, real estate prices have continued to go up. I don't think there have been Google bus protests at the time. There obviously have been since. Is that, from your perspective, is that, is that tension getting worse? And what, for, and what do you think tangibly needs to be done to kind of, that, that folks like you can work on to help with that? Well, I don't know if it's getting worse, but I, I, I don't believe it's getting better. And there's an acute housing shortage in, in Silicon Valley, and there are really acute social needs. You can go from Palo Alto to East Palo Alto. And on, on that front, I think the investments and commitments that uh, folks, leaders from the tech community are making to education, transforming education, and to social services like Second Harvest or to Raphael House, a, a home for battered women. Uh, there's a number of Bay Area leaders. You know who they are. Mark Benioff, for example, who's uh, standing up, and others in more quiet ways uh, trying to pay attention to that. But the gap is widening between the, the rich and the poor. And this is a, I don't want to dodge this problem. This is something we got to deal with. Do you, is it something, do you think it's something that, that tech, tech gets a lot of criticism, or, and tech companies get a lot of criticism for not handling it. Do you think tech has indeed done a particularly poor job compared to other industries, whether that be finance or retail or, or fortune, kind of Fortune 500 companies? Do you think that's a fair criticism that tech has done a worse job, or do you think you're just easier targets? I don't think tech has done a worse job than other industries, and I really admire what some tech industry leaders have done on progressive and social and community agendas. You know what I'm talking about in that regard. But the level of wealth creation, value creation in the tech industry is so high, I think it's reasonable for our communities to look, look for more. John, uh, one of the trends that, that you've talked about in the past, or at least talked with me about, was, was urbanization. And, and you kind of hinted that a bit with just with the proliferation of technology. But also, you know, you've got a lot of people moving to cities, and, and we see that reflected in, a lot, you know, in the on-demand space, for example. But you're somebody who lives in Silicon Valley. You work there. You travel. You come to Aspen. Uh, you, you travel a bit. But how do you, as an investor, and how do you talk to the other folks in your office on Sand Hill Road to mentally, for them to try to What's the word? to judge if something that happens to work down the street and in your community, in your social circle, if that's going to work you know, in Kansas City, or better, if that's going to work in a town 30 miles from Kansas City. Or better, is it going to work in India? Yeah. Is it going to work in Bangalore? So before we make an investment in TrueCaller, which is a cloud-based, you know, why are your contacts in your phone? They want to be in the cloud. They got like over 1.8 billion phone number IDs. But before we'll do that, we get out there and hustle. We fly to India. We meet the users. We meet the strategic partners. We do the diligence that will cause us to say, hey, the risks are here. We're going to go there. And so when I'm, whenever I'm in any town, I ask the Uber driver, why are, you, why are you doing this? You doing it for the convenience, for the extra money? What's the experience like? What can be better? You better be genetically uh, uh, deeply curious or insecure and prepared to hustle if you want to be a competitive venture investor these days. I asked this question in the venture panel earlier, so it'll be my la really my last one to you. What is the, the company that you personally passed on an investment, the, the best company that you missed on? <laughs> when? Which year? <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you take it. Go, go, go the distance. Well, in the early 80s, I didn't go down to the basement of Margaret Jacks Hall, so I missed Cisco, but uh, got Sun and Silicon Graphics. and. So it worked. That, that all worked out. More recently, I guess I really uh, regret not having connected with Facebook, but we had invested in a company, uh, Friendster, that failed. And entrepreneurs want and understandably demand that their investors be loyal. So you cannot invest in every great thing at the early stages. If you miss it at the early stage and it's still a great company, then, as we did, you can make a growth investment. Well, you, you had a rival. We made a growth investment. In you had, but you had a rival investment. You, you had a search company, and you still did Google. And I, did you say you, want, you asked yeah, permission no, we invested of that company in to do it? We asked them what they thought about it. They thought it wasn't such a good idea, and we went ahead anyway and invested. Um, we've got some Lord time for Google. questions. Yeah. Do we have any? If so, raise your hand and uh, someone with a mic. Okay. 
John, when I interviewed in the 1980s, Michael, you said when you were doing it right, when Kleiner Perkins was doing it right, you didn't just invest in new companies, you invested in new industries. Has there been such an explosion of opportunity that the industry is no longer the right unit of analysis to envision the future and that you really do need to think in terms of the talent and the company and the enterprise? So you're no longer looking for industry builders, you're looking for business builders? Yeah, I'm asking, has that been a change for you? Oh, for me personally. Yeah. No, I'm still seduced by extraordinary entrepreneurs who want to change the world in a durable way, not a quick flip but something that's built to last. And the, the area and the entrepreneur I'm most excited about is stealth right now, but it's in the field of digital health, right? We spend three trillion a year on healthcare in the country. Everybody agrees about a third of it's wasted. And finally, the information's getting up in the cloud. So we can, we can maybe make markets out of the healthcare system, which today are dysfunctional, non-existent. Yeah. Do we have any others? Yeah, over there. Mike's coming to you. Hi, Dan Benton. Hi, Dan. Hey, John. Um, what happens with your limited partners and what happens with your funds when you, when, you are, when, you, when you have in the portfolio a company that normally would have gone public years ago, when, you, when you're asked to participate in E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L rounds, how do you fund them? Um, and at what point do your LPs come back and say, we'd like liquidity? Well, it's interesting. We've uh, had some LPs who've raised an idea. I'm not sure it's going to work, but that would be for uh, some LPs to buy a basket of interests in companies to achieve liquidity for earlier funds. So they've expressed interest in that. And as everybody knows in venture business, you're there to serve entrepreneurs as well as limited partners. So, so we're exploring that. Uh, I think we'll see some selling into later stage financings. I recall Axel sold some of their Facebook position, right? Yeah, and some of the Uber investors have already sold. And some of the that. Uber investors are doing that as well. But it used to take four years for a company to go public. That was the average, as you know, in 2000. Now it's more on the order of eight years. And there have been 61, right, unicorns in the US. That's a bigger than billion dollar valuation. Those investors are expecting there'll be an exit for a three billion valuation. And you and I were talking beforehand, I think the way the numbers work is that in the whole tech industry in the US since 2000, don't hold me to this, but I think there've been like seven or eight. Acquisitions. Acquisitions over $3 billion, yeah. right? You had nested, well, you know what they are. So uh, I guess all these companies are gonna change the trend and they're all gonna go public from their growth and projected positive cash flow. Fantastic. Uh, that's all the time we have. John, thank oh you very much for your time. <laughs> thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you.